Welcome back to another video on differential equations. In this lecture, we're going to be diving deeper into the Frobenius method, and then we're going to jump right into the Bessel equation. Recall from last time that when solving a differential equation y double prime plus p of x times y prime plus q of x times y equals zero, where b of x is x minus x naught times p of x, and c of x is x minus x naught whole squared times q of x, both of which have valid Taylor expansions about x equals x naught. If we're solving this differential equation, then we can use Frobenius's method, where we let y of x be the sum from n equals zero to infinity of a n times x minus x naught to the n plus r. And if we're solving this differential equation by Frobenius's method, we end up with what's called an indicial equation during our solution process. The indicial equation can be obtained by plugging in this expression for y back into the differential equation. I leave it to you to verify that the indicial equation is given by r times r minus 1 plus b naught times r plus c naught equals 0, where b naught and c naught are the constant terms in the Taylor expansions of b and c respectively. When you solve the indicial equation to get two values of r, there are three main possibilities. The first is that the roots r1 and r2 are distinct and they don't differ by an integer. And that's what we had in the example last time. Recall that in the example last time we got a solution of r equals 0 0.5 and another r equals 1. And those solutions did not differ by an integer. Their difference was only 0 0.5. And if this is the case, then your general solution is k1 times x minus x naught to the r1 times the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of a n times x minus x naught to the n plus k2 times x minus x naught to the r2 times the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of capital A n times x minus x naught to the n. Now let me explain what this small a n, what this capital A n exactly mean. When you solve the ODE by Frobenius's method, you end up with a recursion relation, usually. The nature of the recursion relation will be different depending on the root of the indicial equation you use. So when you get a recursion relation, that recursion relation will have a term involving r in it. So when you plug in different values of r, that recursion relation is going to be different. So in other words, when you plug in r1, that'll get you one variant of the recursion relation. But when you plug in r2, it'll get you another variant. To get small a n, you solve the r1 variant of the recursion relation. And to get capital a n, you solve the r2 variant of the recursion relation. And that's how you get the a n and the capital a n that are in uh, this general solution when the roots r1 and r2 of the indicial equation don't differ by an integer. The second possibility is that you have two repeated roots. The coefficients a n and y1 are found from the recursion relation you originally get when solving the ODE. However, the coefficients capital a n and y2 are found by plugging y2 back into the ODE and then solving for those capital ANs individually. The third possibility is that you have two roots and they both differ by an integer. In other words, r1 and r2 are distinct and they differ by an integer where r1 is greater than r2. The reason this is a problem is that the two series you end up with one corresponding to r1 and the other corresponding to r2, those series aren't linearly independent. So you can't have a full general solution using two series that aren't linearly independent. And that's why you need a special expression for the second solution once you've found the first. Anyway, here's what you do when you have two roots differing by an integer. y1 looks the same. Again, the coefficients in the y1 power series are found from the original recursion relation you get when solving the ODE. As for y2, the only difference is the presence of this extra coefficient k and the r2 as the power of x minus x naught. The coefficients k and capital A n in y2 are found by plugging y2 back into the ODE and solving the resulting expression. This is very similar to what we would do for repeated roots, but the only difference is that there's an extra coefficient k and there's also an r2 in the power of x minus x naught. So that should hopefully cover everything basic related to Frobenius's method. Now we're going to get to the fun part, and that's solving Bessel's equation. 
Bessel's equation is a special ODE that comes up a lot when you're solving PDEs, especially when you're solving problems in cylindrical coordinates. It's usually written as x squared y double prime plus xy prime plus x squared minus y squared times y equals zero, where p is some number, it's also known as the order of the Bessel function. It can be an integer, it can be a non-integer, it doesn't really matter. Now we want a solution that's going to be expanded about x naught equals zero. But before we begin with our power series method, we will have to check whether x naught equals zero is a singular point or not. Let's divide the whole ODE by x squared and put it in standard form. Clearly, you can see that when x is zero, the coefficients of y prime and y, p of x and q of x, both become undefined. However, if I look at x times p of x, which is one, and x squared times q of x, which is x squared minus p squared, they're both defined and have valid Taylor series expansions at x equals zero. As a result, we know that x equals zero is a regular singular point from what we covered last time. So although we can't use the regular power series method, we can use the Frobenius method. So let's do that. We'll let our solution y be the sum from n equals zero to infinity of a n times x to the n plus r. The first derivative is just the sum from n equals zero to infinity of n plus r times a n times x to the n plus r minus one. Just move the power down and reduce it by one. We can do it again to get the second derivative. Let's plug all of this into the differential equation, and here's what we'll get. The sum from n equals zero to infinity of n plus r times n plus r minus one times a n times x to the n plus r minus two plus one over x times the sum from n equals zero to infinity of n plus r times a n times x to the n plus r minus one plus one minus p squared over x squared times the sum from n equals zero to infinity of a n times x to the n plus r equals zero. We can simplify this just by taking the one over x inside the series and expanding out the last term. Here's where we run into an issue. The powers on x in each summation aren't the same. There are three series that each have x raised to the power n plus r minus two, but there's one series where x is raised to the power n plus r. So we'll take the easier route and change the n plus r to match the n plus r minus two that's found in the other three summations. How we do that is by writing our old index n as a new index m minus two, where m is some dummy index. So when n equals zero, m equals two, which means that in terms of m, our modified series becomes the sum from m equals two to infinity of a sub m minus two times x to the power m plus r minus two. Let's now change our m back to an n to make things more consistent. Hopefully these index changes shouldn't be too confusing. Let's stick this back into our ODE now. But now, notice that we've opened another can of worms. Three of the series start at n equals zero, but one of them starts at n equals two. One way to achieve consistency is to expand out the first two terms out of the other three series, so let's do that. For the first series, the first two terms are r times r minus one times a naught times x to the power r minus two, plus r times r plus one times a one, times x to the power r minus one. So the first series now starts at n equals two. For the second series, we can do the same thing. We'll get r times a naught times x to the r minus two, plus r plus one times a one times x to the r minus one. We can also do the same thing with the third series. So we'll get minus p squared times a naught times x to the r minus two minus p squared times a one times x to the r minus one. Now, because the right-hand side of the equation is zero, the coefficient of every power of x on the left-hand side must also equal zero. So this means that for x to the power r minus two, we have r times r minus one times a naught plus r times a naught minus p squared times a naught equals zero. Now, for our series, we don't want a naught to be zero, so we can cancel a naught from the equation. That leaves us with r times r minus one plus r minus p squared equals zero, or r squared minus p squared equals zero, and if you solve this quadratic equation, which also happens to be our indicial equation, you'll get r equals plus or minus p as your solution. Now let's go back to what was our ODE and form an equation for the coefficient of x to the r minus one, which would just be the following. 
since r is plus or minus p, which clearly doesn't make this equation zero, we must have a1 equals zero in order for the equality to be satisfied. So now that we've solved for r and for a1, what's left is to solve for the coefficients a n. Note that now, because of the equations we just solved, the part that was expanded out earlier is gone, and this is what we're left with. If we gather everything and put it into one summation, we'll get the sum from n equals 2 to infinity of n plus r times n plus r minus 1 plus n plus r minus p squared times a n plus a n minus 2 times x to the power n plus r minus 2 equals 0. Since the coefficients all have to be zero for the equality to be satisfied, we'll get this recursion relation. Simplifying and rearranging some of the terms will give you a n equals negative a sub n minus 2 whole divided by n plus r whole squared minus p squared. Now let's start by substituting r equals p, which is the larger of the solutions to the indicial equation. If we do that, then after expanding out the n plus r whole squared and simplifying things a bit, we'll get this as our recursion relation. Now let's go back and remember that the coefficient a1 of the series is zero. And since each coefficient in the series is related to the one that's two terms behind it, the entire sequence of odd index coefficients is zero because since a1 is zero, a3, which depends on a1, would also be zero, and so on, all because of the nature of the recursion relation. That means that for this particular ODE, we're only worried about the even index coefficient, so we can replace the n, which is going to be even valued by two times k, where k is another integer. In that case, we'll have a sub 2k is negative a sub 2k minus 2 over 4k times k plus p. So let's evaluate some coefficients and see if we can get a general pattern established. a2, which is the coefficient for k equals 1, is just negative a0 over 4 times 1 times 1 plus p. a4, which is the coefficient for k equals 2, is just negative a2 over 4 times 2 times 2 plus p. And in terms of a0, this is just negative 1 whole squared times a0 over 4 squared times 2 times 1 times 2 plus p times 1 plus p. So now hopefully you've seen a pattern develop and that you now recognize that a sub 2k is negative 1 to the power k over 4 to the power k times a naught over k factorial times p plus k times all the way to p plus 1. Since we now have an explicit equation for the 2kth coefficient of the series, we can write down the first solution to our Bessel equation. And that's y1 equals x to the p times the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the k over 4 to the k times a0 over k factorial times p plus k all the way multiplying to p plus 1 multiplied by x to the power 2k. For a particular value of a0, the solution is given a special name. It's called the Bessel function of the first kind and is denoted by j sub p, where p is, you know, the order of the Bessel function. Now, if p isn't an integer, or even a half integer for that matter, then the second solution to the Bessel equation is pretty easy. According to what we mentioned earlier, it would just be x to the power negative p times the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the k over 4 to the k times a0 over k factorial times k minus p all the way multiplying to 1 minus p times x to the power 2k. But when the difference between p and negative p, the roots of the indicial equation, is an integer, or if p is zero and the roots are repeated, our second linearly independent solution is more complicated than this because it's going to involve natural logs and some unknown coefficients, basically what we mentioned near the start of the video. In that case, we'll have something called a Bessel function of the second kind, and that's denoted by y sub p. So I think that at this point, I'm pushing the time limits I set for myself because I know you kids don't have an infinite attention span and you're probably surpassing the curfew that your parents imposed on you, so I'm going to stop here. If you want, I can continue a bit more with Bessel functions and derive more explicit formulas for them, maybe in a lecture 4.5, but in the meantime, I'm going to continue my intro to series to PDEs and start non-dimensionalization.